Well, thank you all for joining me, Dr. Cynthia Lemire and Dr. Charles Jennings. Both of us work at the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Diseases uh, within the Department of Neurology. Uh, and we welcome you to join us as we moderate these poster roundtables, where we're, we are giving poster presenters the opportunity to interact with attendees and for attendees to ask questions live. During today's session, I will introduce each group by name and department, and then each presenter from each group will introduce their poster title and will provide two main takeaways from their poster. After the group finishes introducing themselves, we will open it up for questions. If you have any questions, please be sure to use the Q&A feature on this Zoom webinar. These roundtables are being live captioned and recorded. And so with that, I would like to start with group A. Each group, we have four groups and each group has a total of 15 minutes. And so we'd like to start right away with Dr. Daniel Barron, MD, PhD, Director of the Pain Intervention and Digital Research Program in Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine and Psychiatry. Daniel? Hi, thank you for introduction and happy to introduce my poster, which was titled Depression, Anxiety and Pain, Precision Tools to Measure Behavior and Improve Treatment. And really the two takeaways from our work is that first, we present pilot results that define a quantitative depression anxiety phenotype from questionnaire data in the UK Biobank, and also a digital emotional state assessment with face um, acoustic and linguistic measures. And then second, uh, second goal of the poster is to introduce the pain intervention and digital research program, which I direct, which aims to identify digital biomarkers that assess and monitor chronic pain patients and in the future, uh, provide decision support regarding efficacious treatment. Great, great. Well, thank you very thank you. much. I look forward to the questions. All right, next we have Emma Deary, bachelor's degree, uh, and she is a clinical research coordinator in psychiatry. Emma, could you read your title and tell us a little bit about your poster? Yes, hello, my name is Emma, and um, my poster is entitled Peer Support Experiences in Patients with Hematologic Malignancies, undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And our study was a qualitative study. And the things that I wanted to highlight about it is that we found that these patients were particular, would particularly benefit from uh, receiving a peer support intervention. And patients were really optimistic about joining and that the potential benefits that they spotlighted as being most important would be that they would uh, have a space to uh, be validated in their experience um, and share them with people who have undergone the same treatment that they have as well as providing a space for emotional support um, and talking to others to get an impression about how their treatment might go and what to expect throughout the course of the recovery. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that patients were particularly um, interested in receiving this intervention um, before their transplant even began so that they could know what to expect. And they were also willing to serve as peer mentors um, as the recovery went uh, towards the uh, 100 and 180 days. Great, well, thank you very much. And next up we have Pravavi? Yeah, that's right. I know I'm oh. going to mess it up. Sorry. It's okay. No um, yeah, so hi, I'm Pravavi. I'm a research assistant in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. My poster presentation was on our team study called Implementing Weight Loss Before Total Joint Arthroplasty Using a Remote Dietitian and Mobile App. So this was a randomized controls trial. This study aimed to motivate patients with a BMI over 40 to lose weight to be eligible for a total joint replacement using a remote dietitian and a mobile app. The first key takeaway is that these preliminary results did not show significant changes in BMI in intervention patients. So further enrollment is necessary to draw conclusions. Our, um, our sample size was really small, so the power of the study was really low. Um, another key takeaway is, however, that patients in the intervention group were interviewed at the end of the study, and they reported that they appreciated both the remote dietitian and mobile app. So there's definitely a potential for these tools to help patients seeking a total joint replacement to become eligible for that surgery. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next, we have Nathaniel Goldman, BA, a research fellow in dermatology. Nathaniel? Hi. Um, my name is Nathaniel, and um, our project is titled Crowdsourcing as a Means of Fundraising for Juvenile Dermatomyositis, um, in which we examine the crowdsourcing platform GoFundMe.com 
to characterize the various financial and psychological hardships of um, caregivers for children with this rare disease. And our two main takeaways are that um, we found that travel costs and medical expenses, even for those who had health insurance, were significant hardships, with many caregivers having to cut back on employment to care for um, a child with this disease. And, um, and additionally, that we suggest that telehealth and home treatments might be effective strategies for helping to ameliorate some of these hardships. Great, great, thank you very much. And lastly, we have Amisha Kumar, uh, MPHBA, clinical researcher in endocrinology. Hi, my name is Amisha. I'm currently a public health student at Case Western Reserve University. Um, I've been working alongside Dr. Vanitha Rhoda and Dr. Elaine Yu to look at the impact of language and education on participant research attitudes and engagement in clinical research, specifically looking at the type 1 diabetes bone health connection T1D beacon sub-study. Um, the goal of our study is to understand why there's a higher risk for bone fractures in patients with type 1 diabetes. And in creating our recruitment materials, we found that a lot of the institutional templates at Brigham and Mass General were study centric, making it difficult for patients to understand the relevance of our study and diminishing their likelihood of participation. Our goal here is to study how a patient centric language or educational materials can enhance their experience in clinical research and make them have a positive outlook on participating in such clinical trials and studies. Great. Well, thank you very much. These are all excellent topics. So uh, I welcome everyone, people online and people in this chat room now to please enter questions into the Q&A. And Charles, I'll turn it over to you to moderate the Q&A. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Cindy. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. And uh, thank you, especially to all of our uh, poster presenters. We're very excited to hear what you all have to say. As I say, we will, as Cindy said, we will be uh, looking for your questions in the in the chat, uh, in, excuse me, in the uh, Q&A box. But uh, I also encourage uh, the poster presenters to feel free to ask each other questions and hopefully we'll have an interactive uh, session. But um, just to get things started, I'm gonna um, fire questions at, uh, at, at each person in turn, starting with um, Daniel. So, um, you're looking at, uh, you're measuring uh, anxiety and depression, and uh, you're correlating this, as I understand, with um, computerized um, video and audio recordings, which I assume are recorded through a, a smartphone or some digital device. I and mean, can, you, can you give us a sense of what kind of markers the uh, algorithm is, is, is looking at and, uh, and how it works in practice? All right, thanks, thanks for the question. And then, so the, the video data is separate from the depression anxiety phenotype data at this point, and we very much hope to combine both of them. But so the, the first part defining the depression anxiety phenotype was based on questionnaire data in the UK Biobank. Mm -hmm. What we did is we looked across um, many thousands of responses in order to see what common trends there were in associating depression with anxiety. And so what that figure does is it takes that questionnaire data and plots the responses within a two-dimensional space. And you can see that as depression worsens, so too does anxiety. And so what that, that, that does is it gives us a quantitative position where we can begin to trace where someone is and then how they might change throughout treatment. And then separately, the, the data that I'm presenting in the poster, the video data, was actually gathered when I was a resident at Yale University. And so that was recorded with a very simple uh, consumer-grade video camera and a lapel mic. And so we, we also tested it using a smartphone, and we think that the resolution, both video and audio resolution, is sufficient to get the same sort of features. And so we hope to be able to use smartphones to be able to record video data, process it, and extract these features to better understand depression, anxiety, and pain. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how, how long does it take to extract, how, how much uh, video recording do you need to extract a significant signal, something that sort of gives you a consistent test, retest uh, reliability, or is that still to be determined? Yeah, the, um, the, the video data we had gathered was less than five minutes. Yeah. So what we hope to do is, I mean, as we're looking at each other on this video call, so we can understand something about each other's emotional state just based on a very sparse recording, right? I mean, I've seen 
I don't know, maybe two minutes of your video data, and I can tell you're you seem to be in a pretty good mood. I mean, I don't even know you very well. Right? By the second. <laughs> right. And so it could change, I guess, depending on you know whether I keep rambling on. But um, we hope to be able to narrow that down and be able to define the same features quantitatively that our brains might use to detect someone else's uh, emotional state, or at least as it appears. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Uh, we'd love to chat more. I think each of these presentations, we could have a long conversation, but we don't have time for that. Are we getting uh, any questions? We have questions? four minutes, Charles. We have four minutes. So could I could I ask a quick question? Of, uh, Prava Pravavi, <laughs> Pravi, um, I was just wondering in your study, um, did you also look at whether or not there were any changes in immunity or in the immune system? For example, you know, vitamin D is also thought to affect the immune system. So were you also looking at vitamin D? And my other question was, did you, did, were these patients encouraged to stay on vitamin D after their surgery? Yeah, so we didn't look um, specifically at immunity. We just did, a, um, there were actually 13 labs that patients did at the beginning of the study and at the end. Um, so these, this data was not analyzed because the sample size was so small. Um, but hopefully once we have, you know, a better uh, enrollment, um, then we can look into that. But um, so vitamin D, we did not supplement patients with vitamin D. We did not sit like, you know, um, suggest them to get on the vitamin D pill or to, um, you know, re remove their vitamin D pill from their daily regimen. Um, it's funny that you mentioned vitamin D because um, it's actually one of the other, other studies that our team does um, looking at immunity, but it was not a part of the study in particular. No. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yep. To you, Thank Charles. You. Yes. I have a question for Emma. So um, you're working to set up support groups for patients, uh, undergoing a stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplants. Um, and I'm wondering how, who would be in charge of setting up these uh, groups and managing them? I mean, how would this differ from, for example, an online community such as patients like me? Can you give us a sense of what's unique about your proposed approach? Yeah, yeah. So um, this study right now, the study that we did um, was very just explorative um, for now to see if patients would even be interested in receiving any set type of support. Mm -hmm. um, but theoretically, the group would essentially function, you know, hopefully largely independently, um, you know, patients working simply to um, help other patients who are involved. But we are, have been looking at other groups like like patients like me that ha do have a sort of um, framework set up around it um, that requires minimal intervention from uh, other people. Um, but yeah, then hopefully our study will move forward and be able to create something like that and figure out what is actually feasible for patients, especially with COVID and everything like that, you know, is one of the things we looked at is would an online intervention be more helpful than an in-person intervention and, you know, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. So it would not require moderate, you wouldn't need a clinician as a moderator for the group. Your hope is that it will be self-sustaining. Yes. Yeah. Theoretically, we would be able to um, help train patients uh, on how to best administer or support to other people. But other than that, it would there would not be required a trained physician. Great. Thank you. Um, other questions? Cindy? Uh, I had a question for Nathan, Nathaniel Goldman. Yeah. I was just wondering um, if you're seeing any age specific uh, groups that are participating in this crowdsourcing, the fundraising. Sure. Um, so I'll say, first of all, that I think with social media, it's it's an interesting lens into a lot of the cycle and social issues that people have with certain diseases. Um, so I can say the median age of the patients were eight, but um, obviously eight year olds aren't really making their own GoFundMe. So um, I was finding that about two thirds of the campaigns are actually made on behalf of another family. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there was a lot of um, you know, a, a lot of it, a lot of it were, were just family units. Um, there was a lot of report of having to cut back on employment, um, but really a big diverse group of people that were making these campaigns. Great, great, thank you. Okay, one last question, Charles. Yes, uh, so yeah. question for Anisha. So um, you're trying to recruit uh, underrepresented minorities into clinical studies, which is obviously a, a, a huge and very important challenge. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, uh, you're, you're sort of 
looking to develop new methods. Are there already best practices from industry that you can learn from? I mean, these sort of large and well-funded trials. I'm thinking, for example, the Moderna uh, COVID vaccine trial was uh, well known for being very demographic or relatively demographically realistic. Are there lessons to be learned? Uh, what do you think your study will contribute? I think right now the institutional methods include sending out recruitment letters, doing phone calls for eligible patients, and our, our idea is not to have a new method of recruiting, but to enhance the current method of recruiting. So like often these letters that are sent to patients are talking about, you know, we would love if you could come and help our research team figure out X, Y, Z for our research purposes. And we want to shift that towards we value your participation in our research. Mm -hmm. And it would be great if you could help us understand why there's this higher risk for patients like you so we can advance care. So it's just reframing the way that the current method for clinical research recruitment is built. And that's kind of our aim. So we've done that through um, creating Rally Ads, which is a platform for clinical trial ads at MGH and the whole Boston area. Um, we've looked at recruitment letters, the phone call script. Um, we've even been using the direct to patient gateway method. Um, so those are the kind of the methods we've been working on, but if anyone else has other methods of recruitment, I would love to hear about it as well. And this is terrific. It's really important work. So uh, yeah, Thank you. Good, good luck. Yeah, great. Thanks. Great. Uh, I know we need to move on. I think we are going to move on to group B. Yep. And although there are five presenters listed, there are only three. As far as we know right now, there are three joining us today. So the first is Kimberly Mendoza, MD, PhD, MPH, research associate at the Ariadne Labs in medicine. And Kimberly, if you could introduce your poster. Hey everyone. Um, I, my poster is A Guide to Being Mortal, Testing the What Matters to Me workbook. And primarily the research project was focused on patients with serious life-limiting illness and particularly their interactions in the healthcare system. As we know, it can be very difficult getting just the right care. Some people get unwanted care, others too little, and others the wrong care. So the main takeaway was that using the workbook, the What Matters to Me workbook, um, has shown that our participants rated it as safe, acceptable, easy to use, and it was useful. And the second takeaway is that if the workbook is presented in the right way by a clinician they trust, then it can help redefine and understand the goals and preferences of our serious ill patients to make sure conversations are more efficient. Thank you. Great, awesome. Okay, our next speaker is Farad Nizami, PhD lead investigator in surgery. Farhad, could you please read your poster title and give us a couple of takeaways? Sure. Hi, hi everyone. Um, the, the research I'm doing in my lab is majority computational. So this is, again, a computational work appreciating the role um, life support systems, systems are playing. They are very important. We have seen also the footprint of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in the COVID era. But what is less known about those uh, devices is actually how uh, apparent and abnormal the hemodynamic environment becomes after we turn on such devices. So we should be uh, mindful about the thrombogenesis, blood damage, and so on and so forth. And what we are uh, showing is the potential for computational models to actually play a role in better understanding what's going on inside the body when we are using such mechanical support system devices. Great. Great. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Okay, and our third presenter um, is Jessica Tall, BS and MD candidate, student researcher in obstetrics and gynecology. Jessica, could you read your title and two takeaways, please? Hi, hi. Um, I'm Jessica Tall. I'm a MST at Marshall School of Medicine, and my presentation is Early Detection for Women's Cancers, Disparity and Prevention in Vulnerable Women. The two main takeaways from my poster are that vulnerable women, so women of color, immigrants, those who are non-proficient in English, those who have less educational years of attainment and are from a lower socioeconomic status, have lower rates of early detection screenings for BRCA mutations. And we can alleviate this by 
increasing diversity and inclusion in the healthcare field, increasing trained interpreters in the clinics, and promoting social justice education to all members of the healthcare field. So not just doctors, but those who are actually doing clinical research and are a part of the other steps of um, testing for BRCA mutations. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much. So I believe that Chung-Lei Tang is not with us today. So I think we will open it up to Q&A. We'll have a total of about seven minutes. So we have three speakers and just remember we have seven minutes. So try to keep your answers uh, concise. All right, Cynthia, Charles? Chung-Lei has actually just joined right in time. Uh, oh, okay. Then Chung-Lei Tang is yeah. here, Research Associate in Medicine. If you want to read the title of your talk and then give us two quick takeaways, very quick takeaways. Okay. Uh, uh, our study is to design a member imaging appli uh, application uh, and to help uh, to help a pa patient to save money and to save their uh, visit times to the hospital. Uh, we use the BP um, narrow network to 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 do that, and the text our result is um, member imaging analyze uh, is not uh, is the same same uh, like the the analyze in the uh, survey. So that's our study. Thank you. Okay, and the title of her talk is analysis, mobile image analysis for urinalysis strips using a back propagation neural network. Sorry about that. That's okay. My computer okay. has some problems. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everyone got to see that. Okay, so Charles, do you wanna take over please? Well, uh, sure, thank you everybody. I'll start with uh, Kimberly Mendoza. So uh, thank you very much. Um, sort of really important topic. Um, I wanted to, get a sense of what do you think patients or their families will do differently as a result of, uh, of, of the method that you're developing? And do you have plans to actually measure outcomes? A great question. Um, so what we have noticed is that sometimes patients will have these values and preferences in their minds, but yet have not shared them with their family members. So the workbook allows for this conversation to happen. And as we know, conversations on you know, serious illness care and end of life care don't happen in one single setting, but can happen over a period of time. So the workbook is designed to open that and start asking questions for patients and their families to have that discussion. Um, it allows these values to be shared. That's been the most important thing that we found in our research study. Sometimes a parent would know what they wanted, but their child was not aware that this is indeed the course they wanted to take. Um, what we've done for evaluation is we've looked at like the net promoter score and so far our preliminary results indicate that it's been 50 with 50% 50 promoters and no detractors. Um, we have our uh, analysis that has begun and we've begun to pull out key themes from our interviews and so we're working on finishing that up right now and then hoping to implement it continuously like in the partners network. That's awesome. Can I just ask one quick question because I'm very, very interested in this. Are you... Are you, have you generated the, the notebook or the workbook in different languages? Great question. So I've actually worked with the team in uh, translating it into Spanish and it's also being translated into Mandarin as well. We're hoping to translate into different languages, um, being cognizant of like cultural values and differences in sentence structure that can convey a different message when it's in a different language as well. Great, thank you. Back to you, Charles. Right, so I have a question for Farhad uh, Nazimi. So um, this is a, a device that, as I understand, supplements uh, the pumping action of the heart in patients who are, who, whose uh, cardiac output is insufficient. Um, you're modeling it, uh, if I understood, it's a biomechanical computational model of, uh, of blood flow through the circulatory system. How do you validate that experimentally? Are there well, well-established methods to measure everything that you're modeling, and what what are your plans for doing that? Sure, um, this device is slightly different than the ECMO. Impala is mainly used to bend the left ventricle to avoid the thrombosis when the heart is deteriorating in the power to pump. 
So it's a majority of cases, it's just, just to suck the blood out of the left ventricle and just jet it into the aorta to compensate for the, for the uh, blood flow and, and perfusion for the uh, vital organs. And I, I totally agree with you. Whenever we discuss about computational models, we should also bring uh, the discussion of how valid such models uh, are. There are different ways to do that. There are methods for verification. And in some cases, when we are not really building the computational frame out of scratch and we are using some already approved and already verified um, computational platforms, then we are sure that the equations are, are properly um, modeling what we are after. But for the, for the sake of the validation for the specific case we are modeling, there are some benchmark experiments that we actually do and show that our model is, is uh, predicting the results for that benchmark. Uh, up to high level of accuracy, and when it is proved, then we move on to a more specialized application of the heart that we are doing. Right, great, thank you, Charles. We yeah. have a we have a message. So apparently, the panelists can't write in the Q and A. So Emma Perez has a question for Jessica Tall. Oh, good. Well, Emma, please fire away. Oh, great. Hi, Jessica. You like great poster. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you think clinical decision support in EPIC could help get these patients referred? Like, for example, if they are found to have a diagnosis under 35 or have that family history? I personally, um, based off of a lot of the literature that I've read and kind of looked into, I think any sort of advocacy and information that kind of shows like these certain patients should be like referred to is really helpful for trying to get um, a lot of these women to go get testing a lot of times, uh, especially in a lot of like the literature I've been reading, many minority women are too embarrassed to go get genetically tested because in certain cultures, they don't wanna be the embarrassment to the family. They don't wanna have the shame of potentially having to deal with insurance because of this. So I think again, um, a lot of times, especially when it comes to breast and ovarian cancer, we put a lot of uh, the importance of getting tested and treated on the patient. And that's kind of a lot to ask considering that, you know, cancer is a very complicated disease and a very complicated illness. So I would wholly agree that making some of that responsibility be a little bit more on the clinician, more on the doctor themselves to kind of explain that uh, to the patient would actually aid in them getting tested and actually trying to get these early screenings. Because in some of the trials that we saw, um, a lot of times the clinicians honestly just sat down with the patient and drew out a pedigree and actually sat down, drew out DNA with them they were not only more inclined to come up for testing and for further follow-up tests, but to actually increase testing within their family. So, yes. Thanks, Jessica. Great, thank you. Uh, are there other questions from the, from the panelists or the, the, the presenters? I'm not seeing any in the chat box, but apparently we are not seeing them. If not, okay. I'm going to go ahead. We have uh, one more presenter. Chun -Li yes. yes, I had a question for Chun, Chun Li. So um, I was unclear how many different tests are on the strips that you were examining and are there, are there many different colors, many different stripes, or we're just looking for one, uh, one band to be present or absent? Can you give us a sense of the complexity? Uh, okay. Uh, wait a moment. Am I... Did I, you want me to repeat the question? Okay. okay. How, how many different tests are on one strip? Uh, we, we, we tested about uh, more than thousands. So, so. More than a thousand. Yeah, more than, more, a, thousand. More than a thousand strips. Yeah. Uh, okay. Quite yeah. Good. And uh, our, our um, Accuracy, accuracy is more than uh, 90%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. uh, the, the algorithm is pretty good, but we, uh, in this study, we just uh, compare uh, and analyze on the survey, uh, use the user uh, imaging data, or just uh, uh, analyze mm -hmm. slow uh, user's member phone. Yes. 
Yeah, because uh, and the in the previous study we we analyze our algorithm. So this study we just compare compare which types of um uh, tour we can we can offer is is similar or not similar. <laughs> And the two, uh, because you know, um, um, most uh, um, M Health application uh, require a lot of user data, right? Yes. So uh, for the patient, they will upload their previous information and uh, uh, like uh, uh, your uh, imaging data, and the two, uh, we were uh, processing on our survey and. Uh, so we we want to reduce the uh, patient data use. Uh, yes. So make it easier for the patient. Yeah, yeah, and also um, uh, you know um, member friend take a uh, image is uh, is uh, is now is is not no no better <laughs> than uh, than than the the the, the specific. Uh, 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 photos. So we we think we can reduce uh, the patient's cost and uh, reduce their visit visit hospital times. So yeah. that's 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 why we develop develop this study. Good. Well, thank you. It sounds very promising. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank Good luck. Thank you. How are we doing on time? I think we're probably uh, on now. Yeah. We need to move on to group C. Okay, so group C, we have, I think all five speakers here. So again, with their takeaways and the answers, please keep them short as possible. Um, so our first speaker, our first presenter is Lai Ding, PhD, Senior Imaging Scientist in Medicine, Neurology, Pathology, and Psychiatry. So Lai, do you wanna read your title and give us two takeaways? Okay, sure, thanks. Uh, the poster title is Neural Technology Studio, a suite of advanced technology to support the BWH neuroscience community. Uh, so main takeaway point is the first we're primarily a core facility. We provide a comprehensive platform of advanced instruments to the BWH neuroscience community and beyond. We're open to the general public. That's the imaging, the platform in include our form of imaging, confocal, multi-photon, live cell imaging, the high content soup, the throughput, and, and also now include the NGS, the sequencing and the cell profiling. And the second point I want to, to emphasize is that besides the, the instrument that we also provide, kind of we collaborate deep with our users to provide the consultation on the project, the experimental D, D, design to the post acquisition data analysis. We're also working hard to make our kind of the core uh, uh, major the educational resource on the microscopy and the digital imaging analysis techniques. You can check on our website for more details. Thanks. Great, thank you. And next we have <laughs> Rama, Raman Etomhami, MD Research Fellow in Psychiatry. Could you please read your title and give us a quick summary to two take home messages? Thank you. So we set out to study the effect of learned helplessness on the race based stress symptoms of Asian and Asian American young adults in the US during the COVID-19 pandemic. And our two brief takeaways really is that our data suggests that people with learned helplessness are not more vulnerable to the effects of discrimination on the racial trauma symptoms. Uh, and our data uh, further suggests that when working with Asian Americans suffering from racial trauma symptoms, targeting the learned helplessness mindset may not be sufficient for, for tackling this ra racial trauma. You, you might want to target it for separate reasons, but since managing expectations is essential for successful therapy outcomes, we do not suggest that advocating for tackling a learned helplessness mindset will decrease racial trauma symptoms. Other coping mechanisms may be warranted. Great, thank you very much. Very interesting. All right, next we have Daniel Lamana, uh, HBSC, research trainee in orthopedics. And Daniel, could you 
read your title and give us two takeaways, please. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so our project title is Effective Vitamin D Status and Repletion on Postoperative Total Joint Arthroplasty Complications. Um, the main point is that patients who undergo total joint arthroplasty are commonly vitamin D insufficient, uh, which has been associated with increased risk of postoperative complications, as well as infection in revision surgery. And the second point is that to date, um, both of the vitamin D supplementation regimens in this study um, have increased serum vitamin D to sufficient levels in those um, who were low um, prior to the intervention, which is encouraging as uh, supplementation is relatively safe and inexpensive. Great, thank you. All right, next we have Daniel O'Connor, high school diploma, research assistant in radio bio, uh, radiology, sorry. Um, and if you could read the title of your poster and give us two takeaways. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. So um, the title of our project was Non-Invasive Quantitation of Muscular and Hepatic Fat Mass in Distribution for Treatment Monitoring. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, so basically the goal, the focus of our study, we looked at three different patient groups. Uh, one group of patients had prostate cancer. Uh, the second group had spinal cord injury, and the third group was uh, patients who were who had obesity. And the goal of the study was basically using um, what's called the Dixon MRI method, and we used that method uh, to quantify tissue responsiveness uh, to metabolic and other treatments. And basically, uh, Dixon MRI was used because it's it's really helpful to track and quantify uh, fat distribution, and it's a it's a very good method for um, monitoring the the tissue response to different metabolic treatments. Um, the main takeaways from our study is that number one, uh, Dixon MRI is a non-invasive technique um, that's really useful in measuring um, the physiological tissue responsiveness to metabolic and physical therapies. And additionally, we also found significant differences uh, both in hepatic fat mass and thigh fat mass uh, before and after treatment in our, in our, uh, in our treatment groups. So that was, that was very interesting. Great, great. Okay, and okay. Sorry, I'm taking notes. All right, and then uh, last but not least is Jose Orejas, MD, research fellow in medicine. And could you please give us a little background on your poster and the title, please? Sure. Hi, I am Jose Orejas. I'm a research fellow at the Division of Pulmonary at the Brigham. Uh, so I am presenting sex differences in bronchial mucus plugging among COPD patients. So a mucus plugging is an obstruction of the airways caused by mucus, and that happens often in patients that have COPD. It also has been associated with worsening of this disease. So what we don't know is if this uh, mucus plugging affects any differently women and men. So for that, we checked 2000 CT scans uh, for mucus plugging, and then we quantified. So we realized that women have mucus plugging more often than men. But then when we checked if sex was moderating the relationship between mucus plugging and health, we realized that for most variables, there is no moderation based on sex. Meaning that if you have a mucus plug, you'll be equally affected regardless of being a woman or being a man. There was a little exception for this, that was EVV1. That's the amount of air that the person is able to excel on the first second during a spirometry. That's a test uh, that's often done in COPD patients. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. These are all really interesting. Okay, so now we are getting really tight on time. Um, we have about five minutes. So I would ask that everybody keep their answers short. So Daniel has a question. He has his hand raised. I do. I just, um, I have a question for Jose. Um, Jose, uh, I'm curious to know, where did this uh, idea come from um, in order to compare males and females with respect to mucus plugging? And then sort of like part two would be, is there any research or is there any way that you think that um, having this information will change treatment clinically for these, um, for males and females? Yes, well, there is uh, two differences. One is clinical. We know that uh, among COPD patients, men are, they have a predominance of chronic bronchitis. But interestingly, what we found is that radiologically, women have more mucus plugging. 
right? So the mucus is a component of the chronic bronchitis. So this is an interesting finding. But also we know that in our biology, there's a difference uh, and it's based on the production of progesterone. So progesterone is produced in both men and women, but the, the amount of progesterone that's produced in, in, uh, in the luteal body uh, is, is incredibly high. And the progesterone induces the thickening of mucus at uh, the vaginal level. And during pregnancy, it creates a mucus block in the uterine cervix. So there's a biological basis uh, on, on you know, hormonal uh, level, but also there's this clinical difference that men uh, have uh, kind of like a different presentation of COPD. So these two things led us to um, think that, well, perhaps there, in this component of COPD, that's mucus plugging, there may be a difference too. Great. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Yes, I have a question for Abdul Rahman El Tamani. So, um, I was uh, you're, you're studying uh, learned helplessness in uh, in uh, Asian populations. I was wondering, is there some standard instrument for measuring learned helplessness, and could you explain what that is? Yes, no, indeed. I heard in a mouse, but uh, not so sure about humans. Uh, yes, indeed. The, there is the learned helplessness uh, scale. Uh, and it includes multiple subscales of factors uh, that it measures, and it is a validated scale that has been used. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what the, what we use to uh, and what went into our model. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. There's a question in the Q and A. Yay! Um, yes. There's for Daniel Charles. Do you want to read it? Yes. So this question comes from. Nat uh, I'm going to. Um, mispronounce your name, Nadang Azang Najjar, um, says, currently there are insufficient guidelines to recommend routine vitamin D screening in the general population. Candidates for joint replacement do represent a high-risk population. I am not sure that I've seen vitamin D screening completed from my clinic patients who are preparing for joint replacement. Your project would suggest that screening for vitamin D in total joint replacement patients would be best practice. Thank you for doing this research. So I think it's more a comment than a question, but if you want to respond. Oh, certainly. Um, so this is true, actually. This is one of the reasons why um, the principal investigator, uh, Dr. Antonia Chen, decided to look at um, this question uh, is because there is a link um, between uh, vitamin D and improved immune function uh, on top of the fact that it's relatively safe and inexpensive to administer. Um, and being able to screen patients is a pretty low risk to high, potentially high reward uh, sort of trade-off. Um, and it's not standard of care right now um, at all. So perioperatively, vitamin D is sort of an afterthought. Um, and that's definitely one of the reasons why we're exploring this question further. Great, thank you. Um, if we have time, I have a question for Daniel O'Connor. Um, so you're looking at, uh, you're measuring fat uh, with the MRI scanner and uh, you're looking at obese subjects. And I know that uh, doing MRI is, is often a challenge for uh, larger people. Um, can you give us a sense of the practical difficulties of that? What scanner are you using? Do you need a wide bore scanner to do this work? Yeah, so we, um, we were using uh, a seven Tesla scanner um, at the BPM. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's a wide bore scanner. I mean, these patients are not um, incredibly obese. Uh, I think the, 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 um, requirements are just a BMI, uh, between 25 and 35. So the patients would not be, um, too obese so that they would not be able to fit into the scanner. Um, it would just be off. It, it would be based off of BMI metrics. Um, so I don't, I don't think we ran into any troubles there. Um, but yeah, practic practically speaking, um, it was, it was an effective way to scan these patients. Um, and the Dixon MRI is really good at um, kind of splitting up water and fat images. And that's how we were able to um, kind of uh, look at the volume changes before and after treatment. Right. And it has to be done at seven Tesla, right? You can't do this on a 3T. I think it can be done at 3T as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Dan, I'll, I had a quick question for you too, and then we'll move to lie, but I just had a quick question. Are you in these patients, are you guys collecting blood and looking at other biomarkers? For example, it's known that inflammation is often seen, especially within sites of uh, fat deposition. Mm -hmm. 
is, is are you looking at blood-based biomarkers in conjunction with your study? Yeah, it's actually a great question. Um, so, be, so we are in the uh, center for clinical spectroscopy. So we don't actually look at blood. Uh, we more so we can look at um, metabolites through our through our scanner, but also. Um, yeah, we were not collecting blood um, for this study particularly. Um, we were just using a specific imaging method to be able to quantify um, fat and fat and water volumes because water corresponds to muscle. Um, but yeah, no, we do not have to collect blood. That's part of the reason why um, the Dixon method is a really good like non-invasive way to track uh, treatment responsiveness because you literally you don't need to collect blood. Um, you don't need to do any type of biopsy. It's really just imaging based. So that's, so, that, so that's one of the benefits. Great. Thanks very much. And why I had a quick question for you. Do you have, huh? access to, are you, are you planning to do any, um, spatial transcriptomics type imaging at any point in the future? Uh, can I make it a more specific, kind of what kind of uh, experiment? For spatial, for spatial transcriptomics. So, you know, microscopy yeah. where you have a section and you can look at, basically look at RNA levels across different cells within the section, the brain section. Well, I could like RNA scope, so those kind of- Yeah, that kind of- type of yeah. Yeah, we, we have the equipment to do that and we actually ha have done once with a, 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 a lab B4, but that lab moves out, you know, really? but we do have the microscopes that can do those. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, good that's, uh, right. Okay. <laughs> we, we might just add to that, since I'm also, I work closely with Lai on this, that uh, we have within the neurotechnology studio, we have just set up a Murfish uh, facility. And although it's still not sort of widely open, we are hoping to make it more accessible. So Murfish is a very highly multiplex form of in situ hybridization for anybody who's interested. Uh, come and find us. We'd be glad to glad to talk. Yeah. Great. So I think we need to move on. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everybody in uh, Group C and uh, we should move to Group D. Great. Time. Okay, so now we're on Group D and our first speaker is Emma Perez, MGC genetic counselor and project manager in the Department of Medicine. Emma? Great, thank you. Um, my poster is called Examining the Phenotypes of Mass General Brigham Biobank Participants with the valine 142 isoleucine TTR variant using a genotype first approach. Um, so as part of my job, I return um, actionable results to patients that join the biobank, including results in this TTR gene associated with amyloidosis. Um, so we decided to review these charts from these patients, and everybody did not know about it except for one patient. And then when we reviewed the charts, about 50% were having some related symptoms. And right now, this gene is not on population screening list. So we think there is good evidence to include this on population genetic screening list moving forward um, because it is difficult to diagnose. And also, it is more common in people with African ancestry. So if we're not returning it, it could increase healthcare disparities, specifically in the genetics field. Great, perfect, thank you. The next speaker is Alexander Trapp, and he is a technical research assistant in medicine. Please go ahead. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Alex Trapp. Uh, my poster is entitled Profiling Epigenetic Age in Single Cells. So as you may know, aging is a pretty heterogeneous process. It affects people very differently. And we urgently need metrics and markers to assess aging at the biological level, specifically to validate longevity and rejuvenation interventions. And one of the most common biomarkers for aging is DNA methylation. So this involves a chemical or epigenetic modification to the DNA sequence. And these actually track surprisingly well with aging. So the first takeaway of our work is that I introduced earlier this year a new computational platform that enables biological aging assessment at single cell resolution, which is really intended to help decipher the individual aging trajectories of cells over time in normal aging and in response to interventions. Uh, these types of methylation clocks have been around for a couple of years, but this is really the first time where we can bring it to the single cell level. And related to that is the second takeaway, which I think is actually quite fascinating. So by applying this new framework to embryonic data, to single cell early embryonic data, we uncovered a rejuvenation event 
uh, that occurs during gastrulation. So the age from the gametes is reset for the new individual to zero. And with these single cell approaches, we found that this rejuvenation event is stratified. So it doesn't affect um, lineages the same way. So some lineages undergo rejuvenation and some do not. Thank you. Great, thank you. And our next speaker is Anthony Tristani, a high school diploma research trainee in medicine. Anthony? Awesome, thank you. I'm from Thrombosis Research Group in Cardiology. We did a retrospective cohort analysis titled Mortality, Major Thromboembolic Events, and Major Adverse Cardiovascular Outcomes in Patients with Various Smoking Histories Diagnosed with COVID-19. Two of our major takeaways are that patients with prior or current smoking history did have higher mortality rates than those without in our analysis. And more interestingly, it does not matter if the patient had a current or prior and when their quit date was, they did have that elevated risk level regardless of that status. Great, thank you very much. And then the next speaker is Olivia Tofimak and she's a bachelor's and master's degree and a technical research assistant too in the Department of Pathology. Olivia? Thank you. My poster is titled Development of Clostridioides Difficile Screening for Inflammatory Bowel Disease Patients. And this research is important because methods of screening for Clostridioides Difficile in inflammatory bowel disease patients is currently lacking. So our screening procedure can actually fill that gap. And detecting toxigenic C. difficile early in inflammatory bowel disease patients using enhanced culturing techniques, which is what we found to be most effective at detecting C. difficile, that can actually affect the course of treatment for these patients. Great. Thank you very much. And last but not least is Ting Ting Zhao, who is a PhD and a research scientist in bioinformatics within the Department of Neurology. Ting Ting? Hi, this is Ting Ting. Uh, I'm from Neurology Department, and the title of my poster is Genomics and the Bioinformatics Hub. I think this is the shortest title we have for the event. So this is actually an advertisement for our hub. We provide next-generation sequencing uh, data analysis services, including bulk RNA-seq data analysis, single-cell RNA-seq uh, data analysis, and the spatial transcriptomic data analysis. And in addition, I want to mention that we have two free next-generation sequencing machine for Brigham and Harvard community to use. They are 10X Genomics uh, Chromium and uh, Illumina, Illumina's NextSeq machine. So uh, if, you, if you need to use in your research, feel free to contact us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Timothy. Okay, so now we will open the floor to questions. So please, if anyone, and if you have any problems with questions, just put them in the chat, that's fine. So there is a, a question, Charles, if you wanna go in the Q&A, there is a question. There. Yeah, it, it was for the previous, uh, previous uh, group. Okay. I, think we'll, uh, I think we can take that one offline. But I, I had a question for Emma Perez. So um, I thought this is, this, is, this is fascinating and I'm assuming that the implications of this are not confined to this one gene or this one medical condition. And your, uh, your thoughts as a genetic counselor on the challenge of, you know, as we start uh, sequencing whole genomes, we're presumably going to need to alert clinicians to the risks that uh, a patient may be facing by virtue of their um, genome. And how do you see that playing out in the longer term? Yeah, I think we're moving more and more towards population screening. So, you know, not based on indication, just somebody will show up and get their, you know, whole genome sequence. Yeah. And I think the importance of pre-test counseling is huge because, you know, a whole array of things could show up on that test. Um, so just making sure the patient is aware beforehand and also like uh, creating more resources for providers who may be getting these results in the back end. That's something that we're trying to do at the biobank too, because I think these results catch a lot of people off guards, including ourselves. Um, so we are trying to try to make this process as easy as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If it's okay with you, Charles, I'd like to ask a question of Alexander Trapp. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, I was just wondering in looking at these, the epigenetics and at the single cell level, have you looked at or tried to understand whether or not there are sex differences in the epigenetics? 
Uh, that's a good question, actually. So the single cell data that we've looked at so far has all been from male mice. Uh, so we haven't looked at two different sexes. Um, that, that would be very interesting to look at, especially in the, the rejuvenation embryogenesis axis. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm checking in the okay so uh, I have a question for Anthony Tristani so um, I noticed in your data that uh, the mean age of your smokers is almost 10 years higher than the uh, non-smokers so do you think that that might uh, be confounding your results or is it possible to correct in some way for uh, age specific uh, mortality? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, one thing we're definitely planning on doing going forward is taking what you just pointed out and the finding that it doesn't depend based on quit date. You can have that elevated risk regardless and kind of combine those maybe in a cross-sectional analysis. Figure if you split the age groups down by certain cohorts and from there, see if there's still a difference like that, then that could possibly be a conclusion we could draw. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, Emma has a question. I do, thank you, Cynthia. Um, Ting Ting, I was wondering two questions. How closely do you work with the partners or MGB Lab for Molecular Medicine? And does your group also have the ability to do FIWAS studies? Uh, for the first question, MGB group, I'm not quite familiar with it because uh, I joined this hub uh, six months ago. Got it. But my manager is here. I'm not sure if uh, he can answer this question here. And the, what's your second question again, sorry? Um, does your group do any FIWAS studies, like phenotype association studies, like based on the genetic data you generate? Uh, I think they have done it. Docs don't have done it, but not in my hand. Okay. I mainly cool. work on single cell rna seq data analysis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We, and again, so since Ting Ting is a, is a close colleague, uh, we would be glad to answer questions. There's, you know, there's a, a web page for the Bioinformatics Hub and there's uh, contact information. So anybody who's interested in learning more about uh, the services of the Hub should feel free to reach out to us. Um, and do, John, how, can I ask a question of Olivia? Yeah. Would you mind if I asked her a question? Yeah, go ahead. Olivia, um, I was just wondering with this testing that you're talking about, I mean, it seems very important since C. difficile is so common uh, mm -hmm. and causes such problems. How easy is it, do you think, to implement this testing like, you know, widely? And is it, do you think this will be an expensive test or it'll become a common test at some point? What do yeah, you think? so you're thinking exactly what we're thinking. We want to expand this to vulnerable patients. Um, uh, patients in an ICU, for instance, mm -hmm. and other vulnerable patient populations. So when we were developing the screening process, one of the things that we were keeping in mind is cost and how to make it as streamlined as possible so it will be easy for clinical labs to process these samples. So this is currently an ongoing project, and that's some of the stuff that we're sort of hammering out now is the cost and streamlining. But um, it's, it looks very promising for it to be implemented, you know, hospital-wide, you know, hopefully here at the Brigham and at other hospitals around the country. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to hopefully see that happen. That's awesome. That's really great. Does anyone have any other questions? Or Charles, do you have any other questions? I was like going to ask the same question as you. Does anybody else, you know, do any of the presenters uh, have final questions for each other? Um, I'm not, oh, there's one in the, has just appeared in the chat. So Carrie Alphen Blethams is asking Olivia, are you working on developing screens for, for C. difficile from expelled fecal material that do not require colonoscopy wash? That would yes, more yes, we are. So we are planning on using discarded stool from patients, um, you know, in patients uh, and, and, you know, basically any, any way that we could get some yeah. sort of, of stool material that we could work with, we are, we're gonna use that as part of our, our screening process and procedures. Great, great, thank you. That's awesome. I think we are very close to being out of time. So I think we should end at this point by thanking everybody, uh, all of the participants and thanking the audience as well. I know that the posters will remain online for, 
I think, several weeks. And uh, the contact information for all of the presenters should be available on the Discover Brigham website. So I encourage the audience to reach out to presenters individually if you want to follow up with more questions. Uh, this has been a great discussion. It has been short, so I hope, uh, I hope it will lead to uh, continued discussion going forward. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for, for joining.